Here are some of the tools that we're going to be using to explore the different environments here at Sunken Meadow State Park. And you might want to get some of these for yourself. First off, a field guide. Uh, this is one that's put out by the Stony Brook University. A gu field guide to Long Island Seashore. I use this one a lot. I like it because it actually does fit in your pocket. And we've got some waders. On a warm day like this, you might also just be able to wade in your shorts, that's fine. Assorted nets, dip nets for scooping up different creatures that live in a marine environment. Here's a tray that I got from a uh, science supply uh, organ, um, company. And this is just good for placing animals that you want to get a better look at. It's a nice clean white background. So it gives you a nice view of what the uh, creatures might look like. And Lane and I are going to be doing some seine netting. Okay, this is a seine net. Two poles. The weight, uh, net is weighted on the bottom, so that end sinks. Floats on the top, so that end floats. And the fish get caught in between the two ends and the two people pulling the seine net, which is what we're doing, we'll be doing later. It's a good way to uh, observe a lot of different marine organisms. Some other things you can bring, small plastic containers, Ziploc bags are good as well for temporarily holding creatures before you release them back into their environment. And today I bought this big crate here, a cart, to uh, help us lug some of this stuff. You don't need all of these things but you might consider bringing a few of them on your marine ecosystems exploration. just explored the beach, a part of the beach that's called the Rack Line. And I have to have been down here at Sunken Meadow two days before we filmed this and there was quite a storm, a lot of wave action, and they cast a lot of interesting things up onto the beach. And Lane and I just walked down that beach and collected some things to share with you. Here's one of the more interesting objects that we found. It's the shed skin of a horseshoe crab. Now Lane, it's called a horseshoe crab, but is it really a crab? No, it's not actually a crab. It looks crab-like, so that's why it's called a horseshoe crab. But it's actually uh, more related to uh, animals like um, centipedes, millipedes, arachnids. Uh, arachnids. They're in that group as opposed to the, the, the crustacean group. One of the interesting things about the blood of the horseshoe crab is that unlike our blood, which is iron-based, the blood of the horseshoe crab is copper-based. And it's of great interest to scientists for that and other reasons, so these are often collected for medical research. They're often collected for uh, bait as well. And the, the uh, horseshoe crab come up to shore every spring to late spring to lay their eggs. And those eggs are very important to migrating wading birds, especially the red knot, which is endangered. And a lot of the harvesting of these horseshoe crabs have reduced their numbers and their success at laying the eggs, which have been harmful for the migrating uh, uh, birds that come up the uh, eastern coast and count on those eggs to refuel as they go up to the uh, Arctic to, uh, to breed. 
but this is like every uh, other uh, hard exoskeleton animal shells, um, crabs and whatnot, they, they molt, and this is the result of the molt. So, it's a very ancient animal, uh, lineage of 350 million years old. Very neat. They're especially common here on the beaches in June. That's the best time to observe them because they're coming up on the beaches, as Lane said, to lay their eggs. What do we have here, Lane? Uh, this looks like a, a hard clam, hmm. or quahog. 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 Mercenaria mercenaria. And this is just uh, one shell. There's, they're called bivalves because they have two shells. And uh, anything else you want to add? Well, there's this part of the shell which you'll notice is a deep purple color, and this attracted the attention of the native peoples. In fact, they would harvest this part of the clam and ma manufacture beads from it, and these were used mainly for two purposes, basically as currency, and they considered the purple part the more valuable part of the clam, and it was also used to make belts, and the different colored beads on the belts would be used as a way of recording different events in the tribe's history, sort of like a memory prompt for a uh, tribal chieftain or whoever would have kept the records of the folklore of the tribe. So, an interesting type of shell historically here on Long Island. These are your chowder clams, mm. you know, the little necks, the cherry stones, that's what this species is. Speaking of bivalves, and chowder and seafood. Mm, mm, mm. This is a blue mussel. Now on the sound side, the blue mussels are more common. We're gonna see another type of mussel when we go into the salt marsh. But you can see, as Lane was talking about earlier, this has got two halves to the shell. So that's why it's called a bivalve. Yeah, this is the edible uh, mussel, or blue mussel, that's found uh, along our uh, marine shores uh, on the East Coast. They attach themselves to hard surfaces with these little threads, they, they call bissel threads, and they form dense colonies. As well, you can see growing on the, uh, on the blue uh, mussel these uh, growths, which are barnacles, and these barnacles also attach themselves to any hard surfaces like uh, uh, the backs of, of crabs or clams or uh, pilings or whatnot. And these uh, have a little opening which a little um, fan-like uh, structure comes out and they filter the water. What's interesting about these is these are crustaceans. Mm. These are, um, uh, barnacles are related to crabs and shrimp. They're, they're crustaceans. The, uh, the mussel and the uh, clams are mollusks. These are the blue claw crabs, and uh, they're a very sought after crab for us humans to eat, as well as other animals. And this is the shell of one here. It's a bit faded out in color. Perhaps we'll see uh, a live one in the marsh later, but they have a much bluer color than this. And these are, again, very sought after by crabbers. In fact, I was crabbing with my son a couple weeks ago, right in the Nisiquag, and we got a bunch of crabs. And we made some crab cakes. They're tasty. It's a lot of work, though. Lane, what's this strange-looking thing? Uh, this is actually an egg case. Huh. What do you think it's an egg case for? Some kind of cartilaginous fish. A cartilaginous fish. Very good. It's actually the egg case of a skate, mm. ray. And they actually lay their egg eggs inside of here, and the young hatch inside of this and they and they uh, start to develop and when they reach a certain age they kind of uh, break out of this case and, and swim off and these often wash on shore and you'll see them in the rack. Skates are what I'm usually catching when I'm trying to catch stripers here in Long Island Sound. They're a pretty uh, strange looking fish that's for sure. How are they different from the stripers, they're cartilaginous fish, so they're, they're made of the same thing that my nose and ears are made out of. What about a striper, well, or a silver side, or any of those type of fish? They're another branch of fish lineage, they're the bony fish, and they have actual mm. skeletons made of bone, as opposed to sharks and rays, which have skeletons made of cartilage. All right.
going to explore the dune here. This is the primary dune for this beach. And we're going to identify some of the different plant species that you might see here at uh, Sunken Meadow State Park in the dunes. Let's take a look, Lane. All right, John. This is the time of year when the beach plum is fruiting, flowering about a month or so ago. The uh, flowers are a very showy white blossom. So when the beach plums are blooming in this area, it can be really a spectacular sight. They're very attractive, beautiful flowers. I don't think they taste all that great. Some people like them. But uh, a lot of people have used these to make uh, jams and preserves. Well, the early settlers, European settlers here, certainly did. They utilized this plant to make jam. Probably added some sugar to it if they had it. Yeah. So I'm going to try one out here. Hmm, this just want to be careful because there's poison ivy mixed in here too, and we don't want to no. get that on our hands. Let's this see. This tastes a little better. Hmm. Notice how Pretty sweet. Are... There is a pit in there, though. Yep. Yeah, that one. Not bad. Here's a plant we don't like to see in the dunes. This is called mugwort, and it's a non-native species of plant that was introduced from overseas, whether that's uh, Europe or Asia. And it grows very densely. It tends to uh, choke out any uh, native plants that it grows nearby. It doesn't provide a lot of food or uh, good uh, habitat for animal species. So unfortunately, a plant like this is a problem. How it got here, probably introduced, it looks like some sand was dumped here from somewhere else. Probably the seeds or rootstock mixed in with the sand and wow, it starts growing very quickly. A non-native species here. Here's a handsome looking tree. This is the Japanese black pine, and as the name implies, uh, it isn't native. It was planted basically as a landscape tree uh, because of its ability to thrive in this type of maritime environment, much as the other plants that we've seen. The species is not doing too well. There's a type of insect which bores into the bark, which has been killing off the black pines. Although they're a handsome tree, uh, non-native, and they're dying out bit by bit. Okay, so earlier we saw a black, Japanese black pine, which as we mentioned was planted here uh, for landscape purposes, and that one was pretty healthy. Unfortunately, you see this one is blighted and uh, dying out because of uh, insect damage. So this is what's happening to most of the black pines that you're going to be seeing uh, planted in our state parks along the seashore. Alright, here's a common shrub found along the seashore. This is called bayberry. And you see here there's a profusion of the berries themselves. They have a waxy coating, and in fact, the early uh, European colonists here would harvest these berries and melt off the wax coating and use that to make candles. And the bayberry leaf itself is used as a flavoring in food. And that has a uh, fairly intense smell, so it's sort of a spicy smell to it. So you'll often find dried leaves of this plant at the market as a uh, spice or flavoring for food. There's a great blue heron. Uh, standing over there. Uh, it's hunting, looking for fish, uh, small crabs. It's our uh, largest heron in our area and it's a year-round resident and it's a very 
beautiful, uh, stunning bird. Look how, how still he is and how focused he is. Looking into the water, looking for something that it'll spear, it'll spear it, and then manipulate it and swallow it. Over there we have a cormorant. Uh, most likely double-crested cormorants. Now we also get great cormorants here for part of the year. These look like they're mostly uh, double-crested cormorants. Uh, you can see like a couple of the birds have their wings out. Uh, unlike uh, like ducks and a lot of other uh, aquatic birds, they don't have waterproof feathers. They actually kind of sink in the water. If you ever see a cormorant in the water, you just basically see its neck and head above the water. And that's because they hunt by diving underwater and uh, going after fish. And so being less buoyant is advantageous and makes it easier to swim underwater to, uh, to catch their prey. But then they become kind of waterlogged if they don't dry out. So after they've, they've done that, they come out on rocks like this and they hold their wings out and they dry off. So you often see these cormorants on on the dock posts and, and rocks and even in the trees and they, and they just dry out so they can get nice and dry before they go dive for the next meal. A great egret, uh, one of the common egrets uh, here in the marsh. It's a large white egret with a big orange yellow bill. That's how you can tell them they're, they're larger than the other common egret that you see around here which is the snowy egret. And uh, sort of the same thing that we saw with the heron. They're uh, along the edge of the shore looking for fish and small crabs and they wait patiently and then when they see uh, a fish they suddenly spear it with their with their bill and then they they kind of toss it a little bit. They do this little toss and catch the fish and swallow it and that, that's how they feed. And, uh, they're not here year-round like the heron eats. They, uh, they migrate south to the Gulf Coast and uh, southeastern United States of Florida. We just pulled a seine here in the marsh and we came up with some species that are a bit different than what we saw in the sound. And here's an especially interesting fish and this is called a stickleback. And it's actually related to seahorses which is pretty interesting. And these can tolerate salt, brackish and freshwater conditions. Another interesting habit about this fish is that it actually builds a nest. The um, male is able to excrete a substance, it's a lot like glue, and it glues together a nest out of plant material, and the female lays eggs in the nest, and the stickleback will guard the eggs until they hatch out. So we have two species of fish here that are related. The larger two here are the banded killifish, and the smaller one, the somewhat rounded uh, body, is a mummy chog. These are an important species, not only because they provide food for other larger fish, but also they're pretty good mosquito control. We do have a salt marsh mosquito, and these are one of the fish that help keep those insect populations under control. Banded killifish and mummy chogs.
These are grass shrimp. Very common here in the marsh when we did our seining, we must have pulled up hundreds of these things. And they're gonna be feeding on zooplankton that they're gonna be finding in amongst the Spartina grass that we saw earlier. And they're gonna be definitely a part of the food chain. Lots of different organisms are gonna be eating these shrimp. Okay, so here we've got a very interesting creature. It may not look like a fish, but it is one. It's an American eel. And this is an example of a species whose life cycle takes place in both salt water, brackish, and fresh water. These fish lay their eggs in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic, way out. And then the larvae drift in towards shore. The European eels, their larvae drift towards Europe, and the American eels drift towards our coast. And they seek estuaries like the Long Island Sound, and then travel through those two rivers, like the Nisiquag River or Sunken Meadow Creek where we're at now, and they travel up those rivers into fresh water, and there they develop into adults. And after a number of years, the adults then make the return trip back out through the river, out to the estuary, out to the Atlantic, and out to the Sargasso Sea, where they breed, lay their eggs, and then die. So this is a very good example of a fish that would benefit by dam removal because that would allow better access for species like this to live out their life cycle. They're slippery. Make my cooperate. That's pretty good. You can see the gills are pumping and behind those are the pectoral fins just like most fish have. The dorsal fin runs much of the length of the entire back all the way to the tail. So he's a lot different looking than most fish but definitely a fish. And we're going to take him back and release him. We saw this blue claw crab here. And uh, as we mentioned, this is crab is prized as seafood. And they're pretty common here in the saltwater marsh. And they're a predator. Those pinchers can crack open shellfish. Yeah. They can capture swimming finned fish. See, and they can nip you pretty for it. But... Ah, 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 ah. Uh, let, go, let go, let go. Just let go. Ah. I thought you might get nipped. <laughs> <laughs>